Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this live online event on professionalism, where we'll be sharing the findings from our research. Our presenters today are Suzanne Gibson, Research Manager, and Hannah Pugh, Clinical Fellow and Head of Upstream Regulation at the GDC. And we also have lead researchers from the Association of Dental Education in Europe, Alison Bullock and Sophie Bartlett. Your producers today are myself, Lisa Bainbridge, and Catherine McGurr is moderate, uh, moderating sorry, the Q&A facility for us, which is now open. Please submit your questions at any time during the session. We're also recording the session today and we'll be sharing the video online next week via our YouTube channel. We'll be taking questions throughout, but we'll be answering them at the end of the session uh, when we finished with our presentations. We will be finished by two o'clock, if not before then. Um, I'll now hand over to Suzanne, who's going to take us through her presentation. Over to you, Suzanne. Hello, um, I'm, I'm just going to give um, a couple of minutes by way of an introduction um, to the research that you're going to hear about today. So um, the research that you've been invited to hear about was commissioned as part of the GDC's commitment to developing our approach to upstream regulation. So this was one of the defining aspects of our shifting the balance programme of work and remains a commitment in our current corporate strategy, right time, right place, right touch. So with the ambition to promote professionalism key to our upstream activity, this research is informing the conversations that we continue to have within the GDC and with dental professionals and the public about what professionalism is and how as a regulator we can best support it. One important outcome from this will be an improved and consensus based understanding of what professionalism in dentistry requires and by consensus based we mean an account that is shared and owned by dental professionals, the public and the GDC and that has the support of our wider stakeholders. The ambition is that through this work we'll have a set of principles that reflect and describe what professionalism in dentistry requires in practice and that support and empower both professionals and patients in their decision making. At the same time, the GDC will have a better understanding of how the principles can be used to fulfil our regulatory functions, including informing um, a variety of other aspects of our, of our upstream work. And uh, my colleague Hannah will say more about the next steps at the end of today's webinar. So in terms of the, 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 uh, the research aim, the, the mixed method research that you'll find out more about shortly was commissioned with the aim of exploring how professionalism in dentistry is understood by members of the dental team, the public and others, uh, where there is and isn't agreement, and also enabling us to understand what the evidence suggests about how professionalism can be supported, um, including how it can be taught and assessed. So um, I'll now hand over to Alison uh, to tell you about the study in more detail. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, you'll be hearing from me, I'm Alison Bullock, uh, alongside my colleague Sophie Bartlett today, but I think an important thing to begin by saying is that we are part of a wider team of researchers from the Association for Dental Education in Europe who undertook this study. Alison, that's me, and Sophie are based at Cardiff University along with a number of the other members of the team. In terms of uh, recognising that this piece of research was undertaken on behalf of the General Dental Council, so they commissioned this work, but we, were, we undertook it as independent researchers. So the views and opinions here are expressed that are of ours, the authors, and don't necessarily reflect 
the opinions of the GDC and we have no conflicts of interest to note. In terms of the background and aims of this study, um, it's in the context that registrants are obliged to work in patients' best interests, but the problem is that there seems to be a lack of a shared understanding of what professionalism in, is, what it means, and what a lapse in professionalism might mean. So our aim was to explore that concept and see if there was any consensus on what professionalism means to dental professionals and the public. We had four main areas that we were looking into, what the public expects from dental professionalism and what might cause them to lose trust, how professionalism might be um, thought of and categorised. We also looked at whether expectations of professionalism were similar or different to other professional groups and thought about the teaching and evidencing of professionalism. You'll notice that those two last points are, are in a lighter font because they're not the emphasis of this particular presentation, although we do report on them in our full report. Our methods were mixed and a significant part of the work was a rapid evidence assessment where we did a careful analysis of the literature and extracted detailed information from 92 publications and websites. We undertook a number of um, telephone scoping interviews with topic experts. We held focus groups with dentists, with DCPs and with members of the public. We took part in workshops and panel discussions that were organised by the GDC. And another key part of our study was the Delphi process, which is essentially um, uh, a round of surveys where, we, the, where the intention is to try and seek consensus on various statements. And that is the focus of our um, of much of the presentation today, but I wanted to start off with a few headlines from the broad research. That first point is really important that the whole the broader context of our study is that widespread spread recognition that dental, re dental registrants do behave professionally. That's the broad context. The other key important point is that there appears to be no agreed definition of what professionalism actually means or the specific behaviours that will rep represent a lapse in that professionalism. And here it's so important to think about the context, that's the environment, the setting, whether the behaviour is one off or um, part of a patterned um, unprofessional set of behaviours and the individual judgment. So what's the judgment of the person who is experiencing that particular behaviour? In general, and here I am generalising, uh, the patients related professionalism to behaviour within the clinic. So they really understood professionalism in terms of their dental professional exhibiting good clinical skills, providing a safe environment and communicating clearly and well with them. If we think about the dental professionals, so the dentists and the DCPs, the, the boundary that they saw between what was professional and wasn't in terms of whether what was going on inside and outside work, that boundary was much less clear and more blurred. As I've mentioned before, there was uh, a distinction made between whether the um, particular behaviour was a one-off error or indeed a mistake and or whether it was part of a more patterned um, set of behaviours and what was clearly important was how that behaviour was then um, acted on the follow-up so we all make mistakes what happens afterwards is important and the idea of reflective practice and being supported in learning from mistakes was important in terms of a few more general headlines, all our respondents recognise the importance of good communication, good communication within the team and with patients, treating them with respect and dignity and without discrimination. There's a note there that um, some who we consulted with 
took the opportunity to uh, make some neg negative remarks about the GDC and saw the GDC as an enforcer of professionalism rather than uh, an organisation that was supportive. Growing threats to professionalism, when we asked, when we looked into the future a bit, clearly the, the, there, there, were, there were some threats seen around the use of increasing use of social media and how that becomes a bit of a risky space in terms of professionalism. Other things around um, perhaps um, unwarranted demands from patients around cosmetic dentistry, limited time and limiting funding, those things were putting stress around communication between the dental professional and the um, patient. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Sophie in a minute to, because the main part of our um, report is going to focus on some of the findings from the Delphi study. So I'll hand over to Sophie now. Thank you, Alison. So yes, I'm going to tell you a bit about the results that we had from our Delphi study. So this was a survey method of data collection um, and the purpose here was essentially to identify areas of professionalism that were clearly defined and also areas where there was a greater lack of consensus. So generally we wanted to look at where the professional and private life begins and ends and where they may bleed into one another and also how views might vary across different stakeholder groups. So our Delphi included 53 statements in total, 27 of these related to aspects that we deemed to be unprofessional behaviours and these typically related to workplace behaviour, public behaviour, so behaviour outside of the workplace but in the public eye, and private behaviour, so outside of work and in privacy, so typically not seen by members of the public. And these statements were presented to participants when they were asked to indicate how unprofessional they thought these behaviours were. So we offered them three response options which were not unprofessional, moderately unprofessional and highly unprofessional. Then we also included 26 items that related to aspects considered to be professional behaviours. And again, we split these up according to workplace, public and private scenarios. This time we asked participants to indicate the extent to which they felt these behaviours were necessary from a dental professional. So here they could either say that these behaviours were not necessary, they were desirable or they were essential. So these were all very closed questions, but in order to gain a richer perspective from participants, we also wanted to include some open text comments. So here we allow participants to elaborate on their views and perhaps explain why they felt one behaviour was highly unprofessional and perhaps another was not unprofessional. So we defined consensus as a scenario whereby 70% or more of participants gave the same response to a given statement. So if 70% of people deemed a behaviour to be highly unprofessional, 20% deemed it moderately unprofessional and 10% said it was not unprofessional, we considered this to be consensus having reached at highly unprofessional as a behaviour. If, however, just 40% of people said it was highly unprofessional and 30% said moderately unprofessional and 30% said not unprofessional, this would have not reached consensus. So these items we then included in a second round of the survey. And when we sent out the second round, it went to the same participants from the first round and we also provided them with an aggregate of the results from round one. So this would help to inform their second response. Um, all data was collected over a very short time frame, so just over November and December in 2019. Um, and we were initially aiming for 100 responses and we actually had just over 1000 in round one and over 650 in round two, so that was really promising. Then to give you an idea of the demographics of our participants, we did ask them to indicate their role. Um, so you can see from this graph here that approximately half of our participants were either dentists or dental care professionals, but we also had views from members of the public. So these are people who are not trained in any aspect of dentistry. And we also had views from dental educators or trainers, students, policymakers and regulators. Um, some people indicated the other category and these were generally people who were either retired dental professionals, um, practice managers or practice administrative staff. 
We also asked participants to indicate their age bracket um, and you can see here that we got a very nice distribution of age groups. So we had representatives across voices from different ages. In terms of agreement, so in round one we reached consensus for approximately half of the statements, 27 out of the 53, and then we achieved consensus on a further eight in round two. So just to be clear, we did not reach consensus on all of the items after both rounds, which we are going to explore a bit in the latest parts of this presentation. But generally what we saw was that consensus was greater for the professional behaviours. So people were typically more in agreement about behaviours that they wanted to see from the dental professionals rather than the ones that they perhaps might not want to see or they considered unprofessional to some extent. And there were also some very clear cut areas. So in terms of workplace behaviours, which are highlighted in blue here, um, anything involving discriminating against patients or making sexual advances, um, almost everybody agreed that this was highly unprofessional. In terms of public behaviour, aspects such as sharing sexually explicit pictures on public social media was also very much seen as highly unprofessional. In terms of private behaviour, so although this isn't typically seen by the public or patients, anything involving use of illegal substances um, and particularly ahead of working the next day, this was seen as highly unprofessional as well. And then in terms of professional behaviours that people did want to see from their dental professionals, these generally related to aspects of transparency. So making sure that patients had all the information available to them about various processes and procedures and treatment and cost um, and making sure that professionals had their consent and permission to proceed with these aspects. Um, I'm going to pass back over to Alison now who's going to elaborate a bit more on some of the statements that we included in the Delphi. Yes, thank you Sophie. So what we're trying to do in preparing for this presentation, it's we've had such a wealth of data and it's quite difficult to um, bring it to life in a way. So I hope that the organisation of the next section will be quite engaging for you. There are four components to it. We're going to present you with a selection of statements for you to consider. And these were all statements that didn't reach consensus. We will then give you the results that we had from our Delphi survey. To understand a bit more about the complexity of the um, situations represented by the statements, we have developed some scenarios to help you think about some of that complexity. And when we show these scenarios, it'll be good if you can think about whether your judgment of that particular professional behavior will have changed in relation to the different contexts that are described. And then we're going to draw on a few example comments that we were given in response to the open comments on the survey. So first up here is one example statement and the instruction on the survey was to please choose one option to indicate the extent to which the behaviour is unprofessional. That was and the options were highly unprofessional, moderately or not unprofessional. And this first statement read, getting drunk at home when working the next day. What do you think? I'm going to pause here for a moment to let you privately consider how you would have responded to that statement had you been presented with it. OK, now this next statement is very similar, but it's slightly different. And this time it reads getting drunk in a public bar during the working week. So we have the working week and this time in a public bar rather than at home. Same three response options. I'll let you pause for a moment and have a private think. How would you judge that? OK, 
So here are our results and you can um, ask yourself whether you agree with the majority or not. So the first one was getting drunk at home during the working week. And the majority there rated this as highly unprofessional. And then we broke down the distribution of that um, percentage across the three groups, the public, the dentists and the DCPs. And if you look at those results, you'll see that on this occasion, the public were more lenient in their response in the sense that a smaller proportion rated this as highly unprofessional. So we see it's 60.8 overall, 51.7% from the public. The DCPs were most stringent in their response with nearly 65% overall rating it as highly unprofessional. So there was a difference there. Now the statement around the public bar, getting drunk in a public bar during the working week, the percentage rating it as highly professional was greater. So there's a distinction there between the location, whether at home or in a public bar. And again, the pattern follows the, the responses as before when, with the drinking at home, with the public being more lenient in their, in their judgment than either the dentists or the DCPs. And the DCPs were um, would have if we'd just consulted with them that that would this statement would have reached consensus as being over 70 percent now i can hear already that people are thinking to themselves um well doesn't it depend on what drunk means or what the impact is on the next day or how often it happens so what we've tried to do in developing our scenarios is draw attention to some of these complexities so as we present the scenarios next, have a think about whether your judgment of that behaviour changes. So I'm handing over to Sophie for these. OK, so for our first scenario relating to drinking, we have Donald who arrives at work on a Wednesday morning feeling a bit worse for wear after a few too many drinks at the pub last night. He has always refrained from drinking when working the next day, but last night he was celebrating his son getting into his first choice of university. To be safe, Donald did a breathalyzer test before he left work this morning and was under the drink driving limit. In a slightly different scenario, we still have Donald. We have the same behaviours in terms of going out and having a few drinks and as a one off activity. But this time when he does a breathalyzer test before leaving for work, he finds he's over the drink driving limit. In response, he calls his practice to say he won't be able to make it in this morning and that he will personally call his patients to reschedule appointments. Then a final scenario that we have is Donald arrives at work every Wednesday with a very obvious hangover. Every Tuesday night he plays a friendly game of five-a-side football and afterwards the team go to the pub. It always ends the same and Donald has to get a taxi home in the early hours. Donald barely arrives before his first patient on the Wednesday and there is always a smell of alcohol lingering on him. So all three of these scenarios, although we've made them fictitious, um, they are largely based on some of the responses that we had in the Delphi from real participants. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. Um, this is just to give you an example. So the two scenarios that we started with kind of distinguish between whether or not the effects had worn off by the next day. So many participants said that drinking before work was fine and people and professionals are well within their right to enjoy themselves, but so long as this has worn off by the next day and if they are working and practicing on patients. Some also commented on the frequency of this behavior. So this was touched upon in the final scenario where instead of it being a one off celebratory event, um, it was a regular thing happening every week. Um, and this dentist in particular commented on how this could be indicative of an addiction, which could actually lead to more additional concerns and not just the hangovers. Many participants also reflected on the importance of defining drunk and the degree of drunkenness. So as I said before, they felt it was very OK 
for professionals to enjoy themselves and have some drinks over dinner and they should be able to do that without feeling scrutinized. However, if this went beyond a social activity and the professional was behaving inappropriately or antisocially, then this would be more unprofessional and could bring ill repute to the dentist profession. Okay, back to me. Um, so for this particular statement, moving on, we we are looking at social media and the statement read accepting friends friend requests from patients via social media or sending them. I'll pause a moment to let you have your own private thoughts on how you would rate that. Highly unprofessional, moderately or not unprofessional. The results from our Delphi were quite ambiguous for this in the sense that 54%, the majority rated it as highly unprofessional, and that was distributed quite differently across the three different groups. And on this occasion, it was the public voice who were least comfortable or rated it more unprofessionally than the other two groups. And we can see here, however, that the DCP response is not far adrift from the public response there. OK, so to give you an example of the complexity for the social media aspect, um, we have Susan, who is a general practice dentist. She works in a small community where she has also lived for the past 20 years. Susan is part of the local book club that has a Facebook group which is used to keep in touch and arrange meetings. Susan engages with the Facebook group quite regularly and is Facebook friends with some of the members. Some of these members of the book club are also patients at Susan's practice. Then we also have Beth, who is a dental nurse. One of the patients at the practice is always polite and friendly to her, and she enjoys the small talk when he is being prepped for treatment. She looked him up on Facebook and sent a friend request, which he accepted. She sent him a message, thanks for accepting my friend request, looking great in your holiday photos. And every time he uploads a new photo or post, she will always like it or leave a comment. And finally, we have Daniel, Daniel the hygienist. One of the patients at his practice sent him a friend request on Facebook which he accepted. Daniel will occasionally like some of the patient's posts and the patient will do the same on Daniel's posts. Posts from both individuals are personal rather than professional relating to things such as social activities, relationships, holidays and political views. So these scenarios were drawn on a variety of comments. Um, what was very obvious from people's responses in the open comments was that there was a distinction between the professional sending the friend request and accepting one and if they accepted a friend request from a patient this was considered to be less unprofessional than being the instigator and sending it to the patient um, but this was not a unanimous view and many individuals dentists and members of the public and dental professionals more broadly um, saw no issues either way there was also several comments um, that related to Susan in the first scenario. So there would often be scenarios where professionals work in a very small community or a community where they also live. And often they would already know the patients outside of work and before they had even introduced them as a patient in their surgery and just due to lifestyle factors. So this would be a scenario where it would seem inappropriate to draw a blanket rule on not being friends with these patients outside of work. And I'm going to pass back to Alison for the next scenario. OK, we have just two more examples to uh, run with. And this one is now uh, thinking about discussion about patients care. And the statement reads talking about a patient's dental or medical care co-workers not directly involved in the patient's care. Again, I'm going to pause for a moment for you to consider well, how you might rate that statement.
OK, so here was another statement where consensus wasn't reached and we can see that overall 55% rated it as highly unprofessional. But there was quite a difference again across the three groups with the DCPs rating it more of the DCPs rating it as highly unprofessionals, particularly in comparison with dentists and with the public in a middle position. Now already I can hear you saying, well, it depends. Surely it depends on what's being discussed and in what context. And here again, we use the scenarios to um, highlight some of that complexity of interpretation. OK, so this time we have Lucy who has a patient and she isn't sure on the best treatment plan for her. So she turns to her colleague Mary and says, I have this patient, a 34 year old female. She's displaying significant tooth wear and I'm struggling to decide on the best treatment plan for her. Would I be able to run my thoughts by you? It would really help to have another perspective. Then in a separate scenario, Lucy reveals a bit more information about her patient. So this time she says, I have this patient, Sarah Jones, 34 years old. You may have seen her in here this morning. She was the tall brunette wearing a bright blue jacket. She's displaying significant tooth wear and I'm struggling to decide on the best treatment plan for her. Would I be able to run my thoughts by you? This time Mary responds, "Ah, oh yes, I treat her husband, Mark Jones. He is head teacher at the local high school. Talk me through the treatment options. Then in a final scenario, um, Lucy again discloses quite a lot of information about her patient. Mary responds with, it isn't appropriate to disclose personal information that identifies your patients. They should always remain anonymous. I would be happy to talk through treatment plans, but in future, bear in mind the issues of confidentiality. Lucy immediately realises her mistake, apologises and never repeats this mistake again. So again, these are fictitious scenarios, but based around some of the real comments that we had from our participants. Um, generally speaking, everyone considers that actually if you're trying to get advice about treatment or seeking advice just from a more senior professional or colleague, then this should not be considered unprofessional and actually it would be the professional thing to do in some circumstances. But it was maintained that what was crucial was maintaining the confidentiality and anonymity of this patient. So where this was done in the first scenario, it wasn't done in the second two. And then there was also mention of whether actions were done knowingly. And this goes beyond just this scenario here and in all aspects of professionalism. Um, often it was commented that if, patient, if professionals are behaving knowingly and that they're unprofessional, then this is very much worse than where they kind of do it blissfully unaware and actually it's when they then realise their mistake or lapse in professionalism and how they respond to it and whether they learn from it that's the crucial element. And finally, a final statement for you to consider <clears throat> and this is uh, this time looking at tattoos and facial piercings. And here the options were to choose one again to indicate the extent to which the behaviour or attribute is unprofessional. Having visible tattoos or facial pier piercings. Again, pausing for a moment, how would you judge that? in a quite a different response in terms of the proportion rating it as highly professional, it, unprofessional rather, it was a very small percentage, 8.5% overall, but there wasn't a consensus. So that's an achievement of 70% in any one of the other options. Now this time we looked at the highly unprofessional small group across the age range, ranges because actually there was very little difference between the public the dentists and the DCPs all rating it around 9% in the highly unprofessional group. If we look at age ranges, we can see that the older age range were rather less tolerant, as indicated by 13% of the 45 year old plus group rating it as highly unprofessional. And again, we turn to, to uh, Sophie to draw out some of the challenges with this scenario. 
OK, so this time we have Jack, who is a young, capable dentist five years into his career. He has a number of unoffensive tattoos that are sometimes visible to patients. He also has say, several facial piercings, but always takes them out for work. He has long hair that he ties up neatly during working hours, and he is friendly and communicative with his patients. Um, then in a separate universe where we have Jack still with his unoffensive tattoos, but this time he has several facial piercings which he leaves in and does not cover at work. He has long hair that he ties up loosely and often it falls in front of his face whilst treating patients, but he is still friendly and communicative with his patients. Then in a third scenario, we still have the unoffensive tattoos and the facial piercings which are again kept in for work. This time because the children he treats enjoy looking at them and he feels they are a good distraction for them whilst they are being treated. He is again communicative and friendly with his patients. So this was a really interesting aspect in terms of appearance um, and also many respondents made the important distinguishment between tattoos and facial piercings where tattoos bear no risk to contamination or hygiene issues which could arise from piercings. However, there were some people that often said that actually whether or not you have a tattoo or piercing, there's no influence on your ability to do your job as a dental professional. So I'm going to pass back now to Alison, who's going to kind of give you an overview of what we found from these scenarios. Thanks, Sophie. I just want to um, wind up this bit with uh, uh, a few conclusions. Um, one thing people might be interested in is the is that question, who's most lenient or who's most intolerant of some of the professional behaviours, professionalism challenges? And generally, and I think I must underscore that, generally, the DCPs appear to be the most vigilant or stringent, although there were indeed differences and we've drawn attention to some of those differences in just looking at the sample of statements today. Dentists generally appeared to be the most tolerant or lenient, and then that put the public in a position between the two. But drawing back to one of our very early points overall is that the public were most concerned about the dentist providing safe patient treatment that is well communicated to them. And here we have a statement. I want my dentist to do good dentistry, not be a paragon of virtue. And the other thing to notice is when we look across age groups, and again, this is a generalisation across the, the, the study as a whole, there were typically no significant differences across those groups. But there is some evidence that indicates that generally the older age groups tended to be a bit less tolerant on the statements that we examined than the younger age groups. In terms of drawing together some conclusions then, if we reflect back on some of the, the questions that we were interested in, in terms of what aspects of professionalism the public expect and what might, might lead them to um, lose trust. One thing is really important to note is that the expectations and definitions vary across individuals. It is generally very, uh, it, it's not possible to um, draw a uniform conclusion across all the areas of professionalism that might be considered. Patients want dentists to do good dentistry, the dental team to offer good uh, dental care. Loss in trust is related to whether it's a one-off or repeat uh, offence. And here, the importance of communication is essential. So the poor communication can lead to um, loss of trust. Patients want to be treated with respect and with dignity. And the importance of knowing your audience and considering how actions can be variously interpreted is something to reflect on. So the individual making those interpretations, there'll be cultural and religious differences, for example, There'll be environmental differences and the setting of the context. And again, it will be whether it's a one off or repeated pattern that will be important to um, reflect on there. Looking at categorizations of professionalism, 
the the main uh, areas that we saw where there was distinction and that was between whether the behaviour was happening in or out of work and that distinction between public and private life. Clearly professionalism in the workplace is something that needs to be maintained, but that whole line between private and professional life was very blurry, as some of our scenarios might have highlighted. And there was a question about where does the registrant's professional life begin and end? Clearly there is a right to private life, but it is important to ensure that the ability to do a good job isn't impeded by what goes on in your private life. So professionalism is a complex concept. It's multifaceted and it can be contested, not easily defined. Despite areas of consensus, and we did see them, there is still the case that different stakeholders will, will emphasise some aspects over other aspects of professionalism. What is really important, particularly thinking about a one-off lapse in professionalism, is how it's dealt with afterwards and the extent to which the individual um, making that error of judgment, that mistake, is supported in learning from it, reflecting on their practice, moving on from it. And that can help the individual and will lessen the detrimental effect on the service provision too. So there's scope to think about how we can update our current guidance, guidance to, provo to provide more support so that it's a way of helping people to learn from their mistakes, address the, that sense of any blame culture and move forward. If you, you may be uh, tuning into this and thinking, OK, what would I do if I was um, witnessing an, an area of um, unprofessional behaviour? One thing that you might turn to are the standards and and within those uh, standards from the GDC, the nine principles and many of those principles, if you reflect on those, relate to that sense of professionalism, communication with patients, and consent and so forth. And I think as a, as a final word really, it's to think about the, the dental team as that, as a team. It's teamwork, there's a joint responsibility to ensure good patient care. And if you're a leader of that team, it's about encouraging a culture where people in your team are able to express concerns openly and using complaints procedures as an opportunity to learn and, Im and improve on what's done. I'd like to thank um, the GDC for commissioning this study and to all of the team from AD in contributing to different parts of this, this study. The full report is available online and I'd encourage people to look at that. Um, but just by winding up on today, I'm going to hand over to Hannah Pugh from the GDC, who's going to look at some next steps. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Alison and Sophie, for taking us through your research. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few of the key findings that I've picked out from the research. Um, so as Sophie and Alison just very cleverly demonstrated, professionalism is context dependent and therefore it's not easily defined for every circumstance or individual. Patients expect a consumer service from dental professionals and are influenced by the financial aspects of dental care. So these financial aspects can influence patient experience, access to care and also trust. Um, clinical safety and competence or what happens in a dental appointment are the main concerns of members of the public. And for dental professionals, clinical competence is an assumed aspect of professionalism. Good communication and involving patients in decision making is key and also an essential foundation of trust. And then um, the research also highlighted some barriers to this, including time constraints and also patient requirements. From the Delphi study, some aspects of professionalism appear clear, such as not discriminating against patients, which is great. Um, however, other aspects were less clear, such as personal, personal appearance and where their professional life and personal life begins and ends. 
the Delphi study did show us that a lot of the behaviours did reach a consensus, which is great. However, the areas which didn't achieve a consensus need to be further explored, as these disparities could be potential drivers of complaints being raised against dental professionals. So I'm just going to go and talk about the next steps of this program of work. So this program of work is called Promoting Professionalism. Um, we're going to use this research as a basis to further engage with patients and the public and dental professionals on the reasons for the similarities and the differences found in the research. We especially want to explore when where the um, results were different and that will help us understand more about um, professionalism in general. We want to use um, the research and the engagement that we do to produce principles of professionalism, which will have input from both service users and professionals themselves. And we hope by doing this, we can encourage a shared understanding of professional expectations between the GDC, the public and registrants. And um, so hopefully these principles will go out for public consultation in 2021, 2021, as they say. Um, and these principles will be used as a basis for reviewing and developing the professional standards we set at the GDC. So that's everything for me. Um, we hopefully have lots of questions to answer. Thank you, Hannah. Um, that's great. Thank you to all our presenters. Um, we do have a short amount of time, about 15 minutes from uh, for questions from our audience. Um, Catherine, do you have a question for our speakers? Yes, so we've actually got quite a few questions, so um, we'll try and get through a few of them anyway. Um, Barry asks, from the evidence, what is the best way to assess professionalism in our students and how can you grade professionalism? And who'd like to take that one? I'm happy to kick off on that one. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Barry, for the question. I, I think um, you'll appreciate that the focus of this particular presentation hasn't been on that teaching and assessing um, professionalism question so much. But in terms of the, uh, our, our study, um, the importance of reflective practice is raised. So it depends what time, what, where you're thinking about teaching professionalism, because you can see it as an ongoing activity. So it's not just about what goes on with the undergraduates, although that's clearly highly important in terms of setting foundations. And here there, there, there it's important to recognise that, that students do need an opportunity to engage in discussions around professionalism. But if we see that um, teaching about professionalism as a lifelong learning um, activity, then the importance of reflective practice, having um, an, a work environment where people are able to discuss and share their doubts, their concerns is really important. I guess the other thing to mention there is the whole idea of role modelling and if we are professionals in that workplace, how does what we do and how we behave affect that whole workplace culture and what good and possibly bad habits are we demonstrating to some of our um, more junior colleagues, for example. You also, uh, the question also asked about um, assessment. Uh, I think yes. that about I, how you, we can grade it, or um, particularly in a um, in education. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a really, really hard question, um, <laughs> uh, and there isn't an easy answer to that. Uh, uh, it's uh, akin in a way to how we make judgments uh, or grade reflective pieces of writing, for example. Yeah. It's hard, but I think as much as anything, it's the opportunity to engage in those discussions and to reflect on it um, is the important thing. I'm not sure about the grading of it, but maybe somebody else has a comment. Yeah, did anyone want to add anything to uh, what Alison's just said? No, great, Catherine, can we move on to the next question? Yes, um, we've got one from Dominic. Um, we've got a couple from Dominic, but this one, there's a couple of questions about sort of subjectivity, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So did the panel feel that professionalism can be defined by humans who are subject to subjectivity and emotional um, lability? Um, 
And do you think uh, that human based opinion uh, can define the parameters of professionalism? Sorry, trying to uh, summarise. <laughs> Tricky. Would anyone like to respond? I can try to have a go. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Um, I think we, we kind of touched upon this in the sense that it's knowing your audience and kind of having an awareness that this is subjective and there isn't a kind of black and white scenario for many aspects of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think uh, one comment that came up in some of our focus groups was how it's about having a bit of common sense and just perhaps putting yourselves in the scenario, thinking about how you would maybe feel if somebody was behaving around you as you are behaving to them. But I, it is difficult to adequately define the parameters, um, but I think it's just about full disclosure and having some transparency and just making sure I think a lot of the time from what we saw from the public from their responses in the Delphi and also also with focus groups we had with them they want to give you the benefit of the doubt and they do realize that dental professionals are human um, so a lot of the time if you don't appear to be um, trying to cause offense or something is done innocently and you perhaps if you do have a slight lapse and you realize that mistake and kind of apologize and respond to that mm -hmm. I don't think they will lose trust from that but it is it is difficult and what might be considered unprofessional by one person actually might put another person at ease yeah. um, so it is a very difficult scenario but just kind of reflecting constantly on your behaviors and how and just being aware of how people respond to them yeah Thank you very much, Sophie. Did anyone have anything they wanted to add to that? No, great. Catherine, have you got another question? Yes, I do. Um, one here, um, again, about subjective and about the Delphi. So the challenge is, this is from Shiv, the challenge has always been defining professionalism as it include attributes and behave attitudes, sorry, and behaviours, and it can be very subjective. This is what the Delphi findings show. How do we embed professional values in students? Very good question. Who'd like to take that? Hannah, did you have any comments you'd like to make? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think defining it is difficult and that's why we've used this Delphi well this is why the research uses the Delphi to try and get a consensus on stuff because it's difficult to get a, you know there's no right and wrong answer in a lot of these scenarios and um, how do we embed it in students I think a selecting the right students to go into professions is really important um, B I suppose you know having that correct ethos from the start is very hard as they as they show to teach professionalism and a lot of it's done on modeling so was, mm -hmm. if we have you know good ethical people professional people in universities teaching that teaching um, students then obviously they will model themselves on that kind of behaviors and we do have that and I do think that actually like most of the profession is so so professional and I'm always amazed at um, you know that people do get it and people do exhibit really you know positive behaviors all yeah. the time but yeah, yeah modeling we forget that overarching um statement at the start of the research where you know uh, the vast majority feel that dental professionals are very professional i just would add that we're also doing quite a bit of this scenario type training um, around professionalism with first year students in BTS courses now and we've been running that for a couple of years so hopefully that kind of work will start to embed these um, ideas early in careers and Alison did you have anything you wanted to add? Not especially other than to underscore the whole importance of role modelling and that kind of educational ethos that's created around the discussions of professionalism and I guess the only the, the one thing that does stand out from doing running some of the focus groups is I came away with the impression that some of the newer newly qualified dentists this was a particular example coming through the the system were highly attuned to the importance of professionalism mm -hmm. so well aware of what's in, what's what the um, uh, issues were. Great 
Thank you very much. I think we've got time for one more question, Catherine, if you've got a good one. Yeah, I have. And this is about the methodology. So is a team, it's an anonymous one, is a team of a dentist, DCP and a member of the public appropriate to judge how the general public might judge damage to the reputation of the profession? So I think that goes to the heart of of the Delphi. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, which of our researchers would like to take that one? I'm looking at Suzanne. No, Alison? Uh, I can make a start on that. Great. So I think what does give me some confidence in our findings were the numbers of respondents that we had. Mm -hmm. So that was good. We would have liked more public involvement than we got, but we got um, certainly um, more than we anticipated. And we got lots of dentists and lots of DCPs. So yeah. that was uh, beneficial. And the other thing is to understand that the Delphi was one part of a mixed method study. So yeah. it's not to forget the information that we got in particular from the focus groups, but also the, the vast literature review that we engaged in as well, trying to build on prior work. Yeah, great. Suzanne, did you have anything you wanted to add or? Um, I, I would I would just support that. I mean, I, th I think in terms of the the Delphi, the the important people for us to hear from are um, dental professionals, dentists, and DCPs, and also uh, the public um, who who are the the, the dental patients. Um, but as Alison says, the De the Delphi. Um, is is a um, a rigorous methodology, and and the number of responses to that Delphi study, I think, makes it um, a, a really a really um, a, a exceptional example of how that can be used. But also what what goes into informing the Delphi, which is the literature, the review of the existing research, um, the interviews, focus groups, so that so that we start with that initial. Um, set of, of statements that that we're consulting on. Um, yeah. So it's it's not the final word on the on the subject. Um, and as as will be clear from the the presentations today, this is something that we're now going to take forward. But but I think it's a it's a very ro robust um, and very interesting piece yeah. of work that we'll we'll continue to draw on and, and use. Great. Can I also add just quickly, um, mm -hmm. just to also say the Delphi was piloted before we officially implemented it. So we did send this out to a wide variety of the general public as well as professionals because um, we were aware that there, is, although we did a rich review of the literature, there were bound to be things that we'd forgotten or haven't considered. Um, so we did respond to those and try to make it as encompassing as possible for this very complex scenario. Mm -hmm. Also with um, our focus groups, they were semi-structured um, in their format. So although we had various aspects that we wanted to cover and certain questions, it was very much we did kind of hand over to the participants so the public were able to kind of elaborate on their views and kind of change the direction in certain ways within an extent if they wanted to view on that so it wasn't so um, restricted to what we specifically wanted to find out and looking for the answers that we maybe wanted um, we did try and leave that a bit more open yeah fabulous uh, well thank you Sophie um, it just remains for me to say Thank you to all our presenters today, particularly those from ADEE, Sophie and Alison, who've joined us um, for the presentation. Um, also, thank you to Suzanne and Catherine um, and Hannah, uh, all from the GDC to support the event. Um, I'd like to thank all the participants for joining us today. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, uh, we will be publishing uh, a video of uh, the presentations that we did today. Uh, it's likely to be on our website uh, by next week. Um, and if you have trouble finding it, you'll also find it on our GDC YouTube channel. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.